Hello. Welcome to Synthetic Aperture Radar Technology and Applications, Serving the Humanitarian Needs with Dr. Paul Rosen. I'm Mike Hamilton, your host for this IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcast, which is sponsored by National Instruments. Before we start, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. First, this presentation will be archived. A recording should be posted approximately 24 hours after we finish the presentation. We'll send all registrants an email when the archive webinar goes up so that you can revisit or share it with your colleagues. Second, we encourage questions. We'll answer them at the, at the end of the talk, but you can submit them at any time during the discussion. Enter them in the Q&A box on the left side of the webcast window, and don't forget to click Submit. Third, some words about the interface. You can enlarge slides by clicking on the green rectangle at the top right of the slide area. If you're listening over your computer speakers, you can adjust the volume in the media player area at the upper left of the screen. Remember, you may also need to adjust your system's master volume. The icons at the bottom of the webinar window include a file folder. This links to a resource page where you can download the, the copies of the slides. Now let's introduce our speaker. Dr. Paul Rosen is lead, science, lead project scientist of the ISRO NASA Synthetic Aperture Radar Mission at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the USA. He's also principal investigator and co-investigator on several scientific computing tasks funded by NASA. Prior to this, he was manager of the Radar Science and Engineering Section, a group of, of nearly 130 scientists and engineers defining, designing, and building state-of-the-art instruments for NASA's Earth and Planetary Science missions. His assignments at JPL have centered on scientific and engineering research and development of methods and applications of synthetic aperture radar, or SAR, and interferometric SAR, or INSAR. He was supervisor of the interferometric SAR and systems analysis group at JPL from 1995 until 2002. Dr. Rosen has developed and promoted scientific applications of differential interferometry, including crustal deformation mapping and hazard assessment, and has led several proposals for surface deformation satellite missions. <clears throat> Dr. Rosen was the Shuttle Radar Topography Missions Project Element Manager for Algorithm Development and ver Verification from 1996 to 2000, and was the SRTM Metrology Tiger Team Lead in 2001. From 2002 to 2004, he led a NASA-funded collaboration with the Air Force Research Labs uh, developing dual-use L-band radar technology. Most recently, he has been leading joint interagency radar mission studies. Dr. Rosen is also a visiting faculty member and lecturer at the Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences at Caltech. He has authored or co-authored over 30 journal articles and two book chapters. Prior to JPL, Dr. Rosen worked at Kanazawa University in Kanazawa, Japan, studying wave propagation in plasmas and the dynamics and observations of Saturn rings. As a postdoctoral scholar and graduate student at Stanford University, he studied the properties of the rings of the outer planets by techniques of radio occultation using data acquired from the Voyager satellites, discovering new dynamical features of the rings of Saturn and Uranus. Dr. Rosen is a fellow of the IEEE, past chair of the Metro Los Angeles Section uh, Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society chapter, currently serves on the GRSS Administrative Committee. So now, uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to turn the virtual podium over to Dr. Paul Rosen, for synthetic aperture radar technology and applications serving the humanitarian needs. Paul? Well, thanks, Mike, and uh, good morning or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to give this seminar. I'm going to talk with you about uh, synthetic aperture radar and a specific mission that I'm working on. Um, and here's the outline of my talk. First, we'll talk a little bit about SAR measurements and capabilities. Then uh, I'll give you an overview of the mission that I'm working on. It's called NISAR, or the NASA ISRO SAR mission, and talk about some of the science and applications objectives of the mission, the observations. And then uh, at the end, we'll talk about the humanitarian applications of this particular thing, focusing on disaster response. So let's see if these videos actually work. I'm going to skip forward to this slide and see if it actually works. All right, looks like it's working on my screen. I hope it's working on your screen as well. 
So this is illustrating the synthetic aperture radar principle for those of you who are not familiar with it. So in synthetic aperture radar, a radar is flying at some altitude and it sends a pulse to the ground, it illuminates the ground. And if you pick any given pulse and look at what that uh, would look like as an image, it would look like a big blur. So here we, go. we can see one pulse and you get a blur in the upper right. And then as you add more pulses to the pulse train, you have more information. Basically, you can see that uh, the ground has a different Doppler spectrum going from one side of the beam to the next. And any given target is illuminated by a particular part of the spectrum. So as you, um, let's see, let's loop again. As you collect the pulses, then you can build up uh, information and create uh, create this synthetic aperture through the use of multiple pulses. So here's a still version of the same thing. We have um, different time steps. Uh, one pulse, you get uh, a blurry image. As you add more pulses, the image comes into crisper focus. And then as you go through, the, the entire beam sweeps through a, a given target, you get a full resolution image. So that's synthetic aperture radar. What's so good about SAR? It's a microwave uh, wavelength system, and microwave wavelengths interact with the geometrical and electrical properties of the surface as opposed to their reflective, say, uh, chemical properties. So it really is giving you a, a fundamentally different view of what the Earth looks like. And that's illustrated on the right side of this photo, which uh, shows you uh, an overlay of an optical image taken from a, a, a um, probably Landsat sensor looking at the Sudan Desert and an L-band 24 centimeter wavelength SAR image taken from the shuttle imaging radar A uh, overlaid on top of each other. And you can see that the, the optical image just sees the reflection from the sand on the surface, whereas the SAR is penetrating actually through the sand and looking at the buried uh, channels below the sand sheet. So you're looking at a very different view of the Earth when you're using SAR imagery. And of course, SAR can penetrate not just sand, but it can penetrate clouds. And so you have a reliable source of, um, of uh, imagery day and night and through all different kinds of weather. Um, another aspect uh, is the polarization state of the radar. We can create, since we are con controlling the source of our signal in a synthetic aperture radar, pulsing the energy, we can uh, decide how we want to create that uh, energy. So we can either orient the electromagnetic wave as, as a horizontally polarized wave or vertically, and we can receive that either horizontally or vertically or both at the same time or some other combination. And because surfaces have geometric orientations, uh, when polarized light interacts with those surfaces, they differentially or preferentially scatter different polarizations. And therefore, the polarization gives you an indication of, of just what kind of uh, surface you're looking at. In the bottom right, it's a little bit small, but you can see the city of Los Angeles uh, imaged with a polarimetric sensor, this shuttle imaging radar C, and you can see that the different orientations of the streets in the city show up as different colors, colors here being different polarimetric representations. So as you hit the, a corner of a building which is oriented towards the radar, you get one signature versus if it's orthogonal, you get a different signature. So polarization is a strong indication of the properties of the surface. Phase is another thing that we can exploit with the synthetic aperture system. It's a coherent system, just like a laser would be, uh, but at microwave centimeters uh, scale wavelengths. So we transmit a signal and it propagates to the ground. Uh, we can think of it as a pure sine wave that we're transmitting, even though we tend to code the signal. Um, but as the wave propagates, uh, so many wavelengths are expressed in that propagation distance. It scatters off of a target on the ground and that target um, will create its own phase signature 
generally random because the orientation and positions of scatterers on the ground is sort of randomly arranged from one pixel to the next. So if you were to look at the phase of any given image pixel from a synthetic aperture radar image, you would see a random phase. But when you compare that to um, another observation of the same pixel, there's actually very, um, very um, precise information encoded into that. The pixel itself doesn't change from one time to the next too much, and you just get, the, in the difference of those two phase measurements, you get a measure of the difference in this propagation path length, which is very powerful because you're measuring this at the wavelength scale. The wavelengths are in, on the order of centimeters, and therefore you can potentially um, measure down to fractions of centimeters the differential distance from one observation to the next. So here's a standard radar, uh, synthetic aperture radar image. The brightness is just basically related to the slopes on the surface, as you can see in these mountainous regions, and uh, also um, related to the intrinsic uh, reflectivity of the surface at radar wavelengths. If you add then a second image to that, so for example, you have two images acquired from slightly different vantage points separated by a baseline B, then you can combine those two into what we call an interferogram and create a phase difference map, which looks like what you see on the right, called the interferogram. And that interferogram is, an, is, in this particular case, encoding the topography of the surface. It looks very much like a colorized topographic map, I imagine, to you. And that's exactly what, what it is. So if we go to... Uh, sort of the ultimate manifestation of this kind of uh, system. Here we have a shuttle radar topography mission depicted. Here's the space shuttle. It had a uh, C-band radar in the uh, cargo bay, and uh, it had a 60-meter deployable uh, boom with another antenna on the end. So these are the two dots that we saw in the previous slide, the antenna in the shuttle, the antenna separated by 60-meter, creates a parallax triangle that we can measure interferometrically and create topography from that over the entire world. So you can see in the top left here, the coverage from the shuttle is limited by its orbit, but we covered most of the lower uh, parts of the uh, Earth from 60, plus or minus 60 degrees latitude and created the world's first uh, digital topographic map at 30 meter resolution. And here, uh, this talk first was given in India, so I have a few examples from India. You can see on the left a shaded relief map of the India and, of course, the surrounding countries from the, uh, the topography measurements itself. This is uh, posted at 100 feet or 150 meter resolution, but, of course, it, it was uh, taken at 30 meter resolution. And on the right, in addition, you get the imagery itself. So you can create, this was sort of the first C-band full image mosaic of, uh, of uh, India using the C-band sensor. And you can compare that to the uh, Landsat similar resolution mosaic. And uh, if we had time, we could go over all of the exquisite, interesting details, the correspondences and differences between these two. But we don't have time today. So the other thing, which is um, mostly what NISAR is about, that interferometry can do, is measure surface deformation. So in the previous case, we had two measurements from slightly different vantage points, presumably at the same time. In this case, we're going to take two different measurements at a different time, hopefully from the same vantage point. We're using an aircraft in this particular example, but you can see the aircraft sends its signal, propagates to the ground, and bounces off. And then it comes back and it produces an image, as you see here in this inset. And then it, it comes back at a later time, with the next time step. And you can see, I don't know if you noticed, but we have shown that the ground has moved here. And now we have this little bit of extra path length from the first observation to the second observation. So when we take the second pass and subtract it from the first pass uh, on a pixel by pixel basis to create a, a phase difference image, we're not measuring so much topography, any, topography anymore, but we're measuring the topographic change. And here you can see in this inset uh, the topographic change map of what happens to be an oil field uh, where they're pumping water, uh, sorry, oil from underneath the surface and the surface is subsiding 
and you can see the contours of the change of the surface down to a fraction of a centimeter kind of accuracy, millimeters actually in this case. And this is all from you know, many kilometers up in space, hundreds of kilometers in space, or from an airborne platform. So it's really quite astounding what can be done. So to summarize uh, what we're measuring with, uh, with radar, we are basic, basically measuring geodetically and in an image uh, form the, the changes in the surface of the Earth. So we measure interferograms, which is a measure of the change uh, in position of the surface, how much motion. Another thing that we can measure from that phase is how much, how dissimilar the surface is from one time to the next. I mentioned back earlier that we expect the phase of the surface to stay the same over time, but of course surfaces change. Trees uh, grow and wind blows dirt around on the surface and agriculture and all that kind of thing. It changes the phase of the surface. And so in cases where uh, too much change has occurred uh, at the wavelength scale, we see we see decorrelation of the surface. So we can actually use that as a measure, uh, as a signal, not just as a noise. And then the polarimetry, it tells us uh, the orientations, the shapes, the kinds of classes of features we have on the surface. You can see here some volcanoes embedded in a rainforest. The rainforest is sort of white. The lava flows are the different colors. And then uh, here's a more uh, also forests and uh, other kinds of terrain. You can measure from polarimetry terrain types and then estimate how much uh, vegetative content there is or biomass there is on the surface. So that brings us to the NISAR mission concept. NISAR again stands for NASA ISRO. ISRO is the Indian Space Agency, the NASA ISRO SAR mission. And this is a, fair, a very large partnership between ISRO and NASA, the first of its kind actually of this magnitude. It exploits uh, reflector feed technology. So we have a big 12 meter reflector here with a nine meter boom, spacecraft, and then the radar electronics are all located here. This is an overview of the mission characteristics. Uh, we have uh, two radars actually on this system. NASA is providing the L-band system, and ISRO is providing the S-band system. So 24 centimeters and 12 centimeter wavelength, a factor of two difference, and that allows us to extend our range of sensitivity uh, to all of the different science uh, measurements that we're trying to achieve. So for L-band, because it's a long wavelength, uh, the surfaces tend to look like they're not changing as quickly over time, so we can make long time measurements to look at how the Earth is evolving. It also penetrates more deeply into foliage, which helps us get to the, the core or the meat of the, uh, of the vegetation, the tree trunks and the like. Whereas S-band gives us greater sensitivity to the lighter vegetation, um, and that's great for agriculture, which is one of the focuses that uh, ISRO has in this mission. We're using a new uh, technical technique called the uh, sweepsar technique. I'll say a few words about that in a moment. Um, it uh, allows us to image 240 kilometer swath at once and allows us then to put us into a 12 day exact repeat and get full global coverage. This is unprecedented uh, at full resolution and polarimetry at the same time. So we can effectively make two maps of the Earth every 12 days, once on the ascending part of the orbit, once on the descending part of the orbit, uh, and look effectively at the Earth as a time-lapse uh, movie of change uh, for all these different applications. And the applications that we're looking at are uh, cryosphere, looking at changes in glaciers, natural hazards, looking at volcanoes and earthquakes and far fires, and then agriculture and biomass. Those are our prime objectives. We have uh, some other technical specs that are quite challenging, pointing this very large structure to a fraction of a degree so that we can accomplish the interferometry and controlling the orbit so that we're flying back to almost exactly the same point every 12 days to within 500 meters, again, to enable the interferometry. We cover all land and ice surfaces, and we look left and right so that we can look at the South Pole and the North Pole at different times. So the key characteristics that you could take away from this are that we have dense temporal sampling and spatial sampling. 
comprehensive measurements and uh, new uh, techniques, basically using L and S-band polarimetric data together to get new science observations. And ISRO has agreed with NASA's data policy of free and open data. So a little bit more about the details. We, as I said, we have a 240-kilometer swath with these incidence angles. On the ground, we're flying at 747 kilometers altitude in a dawn-dusk orbit, which is good for minimizing the effects of the ionosphere on our signature. Um, it's a very wide swath. We look at descending and ascending, and we can look left and right. So here's our 12-meter reflector. We have two feeds, an L-band and an S-band, RF aperture side by side. Because of that, we have slightly off-pointed beams, uh, right, less than a degree or so, about a degree or so, um, but that doesn't necessarily uh, cause us any problem in the processing. And uh, because we're slightly inclined from a perfect polar orbit, we have a little bit of a hole at the Arctic or the Antarctic, depending on whether we're pointed right or whether we're pointed left but we will alternate left and right pointing depending on uh, the season and uh, the mission phase. So a little bit more about the swath coverage. This, this sweep star technique allows us to get this 240 kilometer swath, which is key for this rapid repeat and also key for the disaster response, which is our humani humanitarian focus for this mission and the focus of this talk. Um, so the technique allows is is enabled by um, having a digitally accessible uh, feed. So we transmit on all transmit modules, which creates a small area reflection on this large uh, reflector, which then by optics would give us a large swath on the ground. And then by individually addressing each of the feed elements on receive, we can exploit the echo, which is localized in space. It comes back, it reflects off the entire receive aperture, and gets focused down to a particular point on the feed. And that um, then can be digitized. Uh, and of course, this is all happening at the speed of light in real time. So we, we sample all of these um, receive modules at once, all 12 of them and combine them digitally into creating a synthetic uh, swath, which gives us the full coverage. By virtue of the large reflector, the narrowness of the receive beam, we can defeat some of the issues with uh, the imaging uh, that one would have in a conventional synthetic aperture radar. So this is an enabling technology for get, getting wide swath, full resolution, and full polarimetry. So the work share is uh, quite balanced. Uh, ISRO is providing the spacecraft bus, and the electronics that bolt onto the bottom of this structure here. The U.S. is providing all of the um, structure for the instrument, including this octagon here, the 9-meter boom, and the reflector. ISRO is also providing the launch vehicle. So it's a really a major partnership. So just to emphasize our plan at the moment, and we hope continuing on till launch in 2020 is to, and beyond, is to create effectively a reliable source of data on 12-day uh, centers ascending and descending. So here is the nominal observation plan that the science definition team and ISRO uh, and NASA scientists together have put together. You can see we're imaging effectively all the land and ice-covered areas of the Earth. We've got um, all of the background land here covered in one particular mode, sea ice in another mode, ice sheets in a different mode, and ISRO has their own specific targets they want for their agricultural modes. The idea, to, the, to, to first order at least, is to take this uh, map every 12 days and repeat it uh, for the entire duration of the mission, which could be anywhere from three years up to 10 years, depending on how long the mission lasts, uh, the, the flight hardware lasts. And that then gives one a very reliable uh, source of data for looking at time series of deformation, of surface change, of whatever. And one could imagine this as being a prototype for not just a science mission, but an operational mission. So let's see, I have uh, need to speed up a little bit here. Um, you can go through NASA's uh, challenges in humanitarian areas and see how ASAR can benefit. And it, 
it, in summary, basically for everything, global security, food security, w water availability, human health, disaster prediction, and such, SAR has some role that it can play, either through soil moisture measurements, uh, crop monitoring, looking at aquifers through deformation, as I'll show examples of that, moisture and such. All of these kinds of things uh, are, are possible with the SAR mission, particularly when you have a very long and reliable time series, such as what NISAR could potentially produce. Um, and India, as I mentioned, is quite interested in food security. They have over a billion people there and uh, quite a bit of agriculture and droughts and other natural disasters can greatly impact their productivity. So monitoring uh, their agriculture is extremely important. They have a C-band system called RISAT-1 that is doing this right now for light crops and they want to extend this to heavier crops and to their forests as well. Um, because uh, forest, uh, forest management is actually quite important in terms of pollution as well as uh, other, uh, other more uh, scientific related issues. So let's talk a little bit about uh, water resources. The world has uh, aquifers that are exploited for their populations and this chart is just showing that many of these aquifers have many more people drawing using the water than the aquifers can actually support. And this is just showing some of the major aquifers around the world. This one happens to be in the Midwest, showing uh, that uh, there is stress on these uh, water systems. So we have been measuring, using this deformation technique to measure subsidence in various places around the world using existing systems. And here's an example from the Central Valley in California where we have observations from an uh, international system over a four-year period that shows over 70 centimeters of subsidence in the Central Valley from withdrawing the water uh, over that time period. So that's uh, significant. This is happening all over the world, and water managers in, in the U.S. are quite uh, interested in this technology to really understand the distribution. Of course, they have wells at various places and, and water gauges, but they don't really fully understand the extent of the water issues. And these maps are transforming their view of how water is uh, being managed and used. So let's see if I can get this video to work. This is another example of uh, water usage, and this is in the uh, Los Angeles basin now. So what we're seeing here is a analysis of a deformation time series from another international satellite over the Los Angeles Basin. And what you see is drawn on top of the deformation signature, which is in the color, are these earthquake uh, crustal faults. So you can notice this is the um, Los Angeles Basin right here. I hope you can see my cursor circling there. Um, it is controlled by a number of faults. Uh, and you can see the deformation plus or minus one centimeter on a yearly basis. As the, as the water is being pumped out for use uh, in the summertime and pumped back in for recharge in the wintertime when it's raining and wet in Los Angeles. So this kind of signature is, of course, not really, uh, had not really been anticipated on this kind of a scale. And the way in which the surface deforms, the physics of what's happening below the surface is really quite, um, quite amazing and uh, quite astounding to scientists. So this is a very rich data set and just an example of what one can do with, if you had global coverage with a mission like NISAR. You can see there's a lot of areas that simply weren't mapped because of the nature of this sensor. And we don't have, this particular sensor is no longer existing and uh, NISAR would be a reliable U.S. data source for this. The other area from, uh, from a humanitarian point of view is disaster response. And many people are looking for, to NISAR as a pathfinder for that. So this is a plot showing the probability that you'll see any given target on the Earth uh, after so many days. And this is for different latitudes, or different colors or different latitudes, from zero degree latitude at the equator up to 60 degrees. So what's, what it's showing is that, uh, for example, uh, you, can, you have a 55% chance of seeing any given location at the equator within three days, 
77% chance of seeing any given lake location at mid-latitudes at four days uh, after a disaster. This doesn't seem terribly great uh, for an operational system that needs to respond immediately, but it's actually quite good when you look at the timeline of many major disasters, uh, which often evolve over, even if they happen instantly, the response evolves over a period of weeks to months. And when you combine this kind of capability with the other international sensors, it actually becomes quite powerful. To illustrate that, we have uh, an example here using, again, international satellite data that happened to be taken of the Christchurch uh, earthquake region from before to after an earthquake. So there was a Christ, there's uh, an a earthquake in 2011 in uh, Christchurch, New Zealand. And uh, a satellite image was taken beforehand sometime, probably uh, somewhere in the year beforehand, and then almost immediately after the earthquake. Uh, so the USGS uses the global network of seismic signals to put out a shake map right away and um, tell you that there was some damage. The radar created data uh, within a few days after the data were acquired and was able to produce what we call a damage proxy map, which is basically a measure of the correlation, as I described earlier, how much the surface has changed from one time to the next. And uh, you can see some very distinctive patterns of change in the Christchurch. So dial uh, into, into the future four months later in June, you can see what the official on-ground uh, observations were able to produce for a damage map of the area. And you can see very close correspondences in many of these areas to what the radar showed within a few days. It's not a perfect match, but if you give the ground people yet another four months to, do, to complete the survey, so eight months after the event itself, you can start to see damage that is uh, actually quite a bit closer to what we have with the radar data. So, you know, what this is telling you is that the radar has a potential for very quickly giving you a synoptic view of damage uh, from earthquakes and other similar disasters. And uh, even though it's not perfect, this was just a couple of images. Uh, if you had a time series such as what NISAR can produce, um, we just think the potential for, for not just showing that there is damage, but perhaps even identifying, identifying what kind of damage is quite high. So moving on to another earthquake, there was a huge earthquake in Nepal in 2015. This is uh, in the Himalaya region. You can see the long history of earthquakes over time as the uh, Indian subcontinent thrusts up into the uh, main continent up here, the Eurasian plate. And of course, uh, as with all of these earthquakes, there's terrific uh, views of the damage that uh, occurs um, especially in places with unreinforced uh, buildings, such as in this area. Not only uh, did uh, JPL respond with radar imagery, they've developed a terahertz type of uh, um, person finder uh, that I guess looks for heartbeats and uh, things like that uh, buried beneath rubble, and that was deployed and actually used to rescue several people. I won't be talking about that, though, here. So there are humanitarian needs in response to disasters. Of course, we need data as quickly as possible. Zero to three weeks seems to be the timeline for, for usefulness for these kinds of data. And then scientifically, of course, we want to understand the source of earthquakes and, and, uh, and what the risks they, pro they pose are. Here's the timeline for the Nepal response again. Using similar techniques, uh, the USGS produces um, a shake map very quickly and an estimate of what happened on the fault. Um, the Sentinel-1 European system flew over some days later, day five, and uh, data started coming out from these various sensors over the next several days. And as data was acquired, they were combined and the, the um, estimates of what happened at depth, these are basically slip along fault types of maps, was improved as time went on. So this is an example of the deformation field from this earthquake. It's a little hard to see on the left. Uh, it's a 240 kilometer swath here. 
stitched together, but the deformation pattern is uh, encoded in this very uh, dense region right here. Uh, and you can see on the right an L-band sensor similar to what we would have for NISAR showing that deformation pattern kind of as a bullseye. So you can see left C-band, short wavelength, lots of noise and a lot of uh, very high rate uh, change. Uh, L-band, great for this kind of disaster. It works very well in uh, mountainous regions, in uh, vegetated regions, and can track very large signals. This is another version of the L-band sensor with a much wider swath, which is much closer to what NISAR will have. And this is showing the deformation on the ground in a synoptic form from the uh, L-band sensor, from ALOS2, from JAXA, as well as GPS vectors on top of it. So what you're looking at here is a displacement map. You can see one meter of displacement towards the radar uh, near Kathmandu, one meter of displacement away from the radar, further north of that, and horizontal lateral displacements uh, on the order of a meter or two uh, throughout that region. So huge earthquake, huge effects on the earth, and no surprise that there is a lot of damage to the areas there. From these uh, measurements, we can then uh, model what happened at depth and we can use those models to predict what the ground displacement will be and that helps uh, predicted ground displacement can help people understand uh, better what's going on uh, on the ground where they might expect to see damage in addition to the correlation maps. So here you can see a correlation map of the Kathmandu area. Uh, the redder it is, the more damage there is and uh, we have very specific measurements of places where we expect to see damage. And actually, um, we, NGA, our National Geospatial uh, Intelligence Agency, which uh, also has a response effort with very high resolution sensors, was able to use these uh, estimates as cues for uh, looking at specific areas on the ground. Because their sensors are high resolution, they have a narrow field of view, they can't map everything all at once as they fly over. So having something that can cue them in to specific areas turned out to be extremely helpful in the response to the uh, Nepal earthquake. Here's a big uh, landslide region uh, in, a, in a city called, uh, or a village called Langtang. Uh, again, this damage proxy map can identify it quite clearly, and you can see major change in the optical imagery. Again, if you had the optical imagery everywhere and it wasn't cloudy and it wasn't dark, you could do this similar kinds of techniques, but the radar creates this reliable um, way, especially at modest resolutions, of cueing other systems as to where to look. So we've used this um, technique for a variety of disasters, floods, or, uh, volcanic eruptions, and, uh, and uh, earthquakes as well, and worked with a number of different agencies and organizations around the world to, uh, to respond in a variety of ways to different kinds of disasters. So uh, in summary, uh, NISAR, the NASA ISRO SAR mission, is a new NASA ISRO partnership. It's scheduled for launch in 2020. Uh, ISRO would like to launch it earlier. Uh, NASA claims they'd like to launch it a little later, <laughs> but we'll see. We're shooting for 2020. Um, the International Constellation of SAR satellites has already demonstrated this potential of SAR for humanitarian applications. <coughs> Excuse me, looking at soil moisture looking at water table changes, looking at uh, disaster monitoring and uh, mitigation. Uh, and we believe that NISAR, because of its unique uh, full resolution, full polarimetry, full time sampling on ascending and descending parts of the orbit, uh, will, uh, will really help uh, to make this more of an operational kind of uh, disaster response capability for the nation and for the world. So with that, I think I'm finished my talk and I think I've left plenty of time for questions. So thank you for your attention.
Great. Thank, thanks a lot, Paul. That was a wonderful talk. You're welcome. Okay, so now it's time for our question and answer session. <clears throat> so before we start, uh, remember that you can still submit questions through the through the Q and A panel. Uh, so please do that if you uh, if you have questions. Okay, so uh, we have a handful of questions here, uh, and we've sifted through to find uh, to find ones that are uh, interesting to uh, to a lot of people. Uh, so one question here is. Can you do phase uh, on water, or sea and ocean, too, uh, with, with SAR? So the phase uh, for repeat pass uh, interferometry does not correlate from one time to the next. No, you can't do that because the water is constantly changing. It's just like, uh, uh, it's just like digging up the ground. <laughs> it's completely different. However, uh, you can do it uh, to measure topography. For example, SRTM used the phase difference from these two simultaneous measurements from the two different vantage points. They used those phase measurements as our zero reference for topography. Uh, so yes, you can do it for a single path system. You cannot do it for a repeat path system. OK, uh, let's see. Um Here's one that is, what is the relationship between the pulse length and the speed of the measuring platform? Or can you make any comments about that? The pulse length or the, or the pulse repetition frequency? There's not necessarily a correlation between the pulse length that you're transmitting and the speed of the platform. Um, the pulse repetition frequency is definitely related to the speed of the platform because the speed of the platform um, creates effectively your Doppler spectrum and you need to you need to satisfy the Nyquist sampling criterion when you have a synthetic aperture radar system you need to sample the total Doppler spectrum so uh, given whatever your beam width is and your velocity you'll have a particular Doppler, Doppler spectrum and you need to pulse fast enough to sample that Okay, we have another one here that uh, is uh, related to the, um, I guess, the, the, walk, the aquifers that you showed uh, in, in the LA region. So how can, mm -hmm. how can the SAR measure aquifers that are hundreds of feet below the surface? Uh, the question refers to penetrating that deep uh, and that uh, one wouldn't expect this from, from radar. So wondering if you could clarify that for the, for the audience. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's an it's an indirect measurement of what's happening at depth. We're not actually penetrating, uh, except for the example I showed you of the L-band radar penetrating a few feet or to a few meters below the sand sheets to look at the buried channels in the, in the Sudan. Generally speaking, we are looking at the surface. Uh, so it's the deformation of the surface itself that is a proxy measurement of what's happening at depth in the aquifer. So if uh, water managers are pumping water out of the aquifer, that aquifer then doesn't have the water there to hold the surface above it up, and the whole surface then compresses. All of the, the material above it subsides and that makes a motion, a downward motion of the surface. So what we're measuring with this repeat pass interferometric technique is the relative motion over time of the surface, downward if uh, water is being pumped out. So some aquifers uh, are not visible that way because the rock that's between the aquifer and the, and the top of the surface is quite stable and doesn't really allow for um, very much subsidence. Uh, but many, many aquifers around the world do have uh, properties, uh, soft enough properties of the, or ductile enough properties of the surface that uh, we can measure the deformation of the surface and infer what's going on at depth. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I, I, I think that clarifies it uh, plenty. And it's really interesting to see uh, over the seasons, uh, you know, going up and down uh, with yes. the season. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. 
Uh, okay, yeah. here's one uh, for uh, I think that's relevant to to, to this talk. Uh, can you comment on the utility of of ground-based SAR for humanitarian challenges? Um, so my I'm not an expert in this, and generally speaking, uh, any system, any technical system, if you put a clever enough person on the job, will find a way to use it for <laughs> good things. So, and I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about ground-based systems in that context. So I wouldn't want to say anything too negative about it. Uh, my, my sense, however, is that ground-based systems are, by their nature, rooted in particular uh, locations. So if you're looking at, uh, you, you kind of have to wait for a disaster to occur <laughs> or fly the thing to that location in order to use it. Um, so I don't know how useful they might be. Uh, certainly, w the example I mentioned before of a terahertz radar being sent to Nepal to look for humans buried underneath uh, rubble uh, was successful. And I know that there are many, many uh, radars of that nature that are um, likely to be usable. Uh, so I think there are applications. Um, I don't know how widespread they are. I know of other ground-based interferometric systems that are being used, for example, for monitoring glaciers and landslides. Uh, the, these are portable setups uh, on basically tripods controlled by a separate computer. They're very stable, very accurate uh, commercial systems. People buy them, place them uh, in front of a landslide area, and they continuously monitor to make sure that uh, things are not changing too rapidly. So I could imagine that after uh, an event, one could use such systems for that kind of monitoring. I'd have to think more deeply, though, about uh, uh, the broader context. Those are just a couple of anecdotes. I think that's a great answer. I think it's a great answer. Okay. Uh, and actually, this uh, this next question probably relates more b uh, back to the previous question with the aquifers. But here's a question on uh, using SAR to see effects or has SAR been used to see the effects of fracking in the U.S.? Yes. Uh, in fact, <laughs> when we started uh, designing this mission concept with, uh, with the science definition team for solid earth type deformation, crustal deformation, we had focused on plate boundaries, places where we kind of knew that deformation would occur. And so actually many parts of the world were just left out uh, because we were trying to be a little conservative and not uh, worry too much about global coverage. But as as the fracking industry grew over the past several years and as uh, our interaction with other science communities uh, led to greater understanding of just the, what the demand for this, these data would be, we decided to go with this blanket coverage map. And, and the fracking, the oil industry and fracking aspect is one reason why we decided let's not be uh, regionally exclusive. Let's just try to cover everything. There's some examples of uh, fracking deformation in Oklahoma that have been used to brief uh, our various sponsors about the value of these data uh, once the mission's up there. All right, OK. OK, here's a question regarding uh, vegetation. Could you use uh, imagery from NISAR to, uh, to assist with uh, understanding things like vegetation index? Um, yeah, so the vegetation index is um, one metric of how much vegetation there is. Uh, they tend to not be very accurate for um, for uh, large amounts of biomass because they're basically looking at the color and the color often comes from the leaves and the leaves are not a very strong indication of biomass and that might not necessarily be a strong indication of crop health and that kind of thing. What we're trying to do with NISAR is measure the biomass itself. Um, it turns out that uh, for many different crop types and uh, and vegetation types, there's a fairly good, strong relationship between the amount of biomass and the brightness of the radar reflectivity, basically sort of exponential curves uh, showing that relationship. And the curves have different coefficients depending on the 
type of vegetation. So what we're trying to do is uh, actually measure the biomass globally and biomass change over, especially over growing seasons, so that we can uh, give them not just a vegetation index measure, but also a more quantitative measure of the production. And that uh, is, that's the holy grail. So I guess the answer is yes, we're trying to calculate something like a vegetation index, but it's more in terms of the, uh, the biomass. Okay, and then that would be used in, in conjunction with uh, information from other sources as well. Of, of course, to, yeah. to build up the picture, yeah. 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 Uh, here's here's a, a somewhat general question, uh, and, and just maybe it just opens up uh, an area that you can just make some comments in. But what is what is the preferred frequency range and bandwidth for the the types of systems that you're putting together? Uh, well, that's a hard one to answer because there's so many different applications. Um, Maybe so just for some humani- comments. Yeah, sure. So, so for humanitarian needs, since that's the focus of this talk, um, I would say that, to be perfectly honest, you would want a higher resolution system than what uh, NISAR is going to, to provide because you want to measure things at a human scale. So the kinds of systems that, uh, that are one meter resolution or better so the band, very wide bandwidth systems would be great for humanitarian purposes. The problem is that none of those systems, nobody can afford to have that and get the kind of coverage before and after a disaster to do the kinds of things we've been talking about here. So um, high resolution is great, but uh, continuous time sampling is also great. So... Uh, in terms of bandwidth, I would say you need both kinds of systems. Uh, and uh, for NISAR, we are operating sort of at a bandwidth of 20, 20 to 40 megahertz, typically, which gives us roughly 5 to 10 meter resolution on the ground, which is a pretty good resolution for many, many science applications and many, many other applications as well. For targeted response, uh, you would probably want uh, greater than 200 megahertz type bandwidth for meter class uh, or better uh, resolution. Um, in terms of the wavelength, again, um, this is somewhat a, an emotional <laughs> question for different uh, people who use data. I happen to long, like the longer wavelengths because they tend to give you more contrast and give you more information. They penetrate into uh, vegetation surfaces, um, and uh, they, they can interact with the top layers of the soil. So they're really quite rich in information. X-band systems, three centimeters, there's many of them, and they have wide bandwidth, so you can make great high-resolution imagery. But the information tends to saturate, and um, it, I don't feel it's as rich. Ideally, you would like a multi-frequency uh, and multi-bandwidth systems to be able to optimize. Uh, but I, I don't. It really depends on the application as to what you would like the most. The reason we picked L-band for NISAR is because we want to be able to measure change over long periods of time. And since surfaces do randomize over time, the longer wavelength helps us to minimize that randomizing effect. Sounds good. Okay, we've got time for another, uh, uh, may- maybe one more question, maybe we can squeeze in two. Uh, so here's a question about uh, SAR at sub-millimeter wave uh, frequencies and above. What are the benefits of doing SAR at these higher frequencies? Uh, um, you, pointed out, you pointed out the terahertz in Nepal, so are there other? Yeah, so SAR is tough because, um, at least from space, and maybe even from uh, uh, airborne systems, because uh, at those wavelengths, um, you you can't claim all weather <laughs> day and night. Well, day and night, yes, but not, you can't claim all weather anymore. Uh, you tend to have a lot of influence of, of environmental factors on it. I think the main benefit is resolution. They tend to have very, very wide bandwidths at the at those those short wavelengths. Um, and sensitivity. Um, the terahertz system, of course, only works for a few tens of feet. So SAR is generally a remote sensing tool, 
and difficult to do from very large distances. But to, to be the, the absorption gets you. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so maybe we'll uh, we'll take this uh, as the last question here. Can you can you recommend a good resource for learning the basics of this type of radar? Not that we want to promote anything in particular here, but if you have any hints on good sources of information for this, um, that would be uh, that would be good. To so know. I'll I'll take that to mean this type meaning SAR in general and INSAR in polarimetry. Um, I think that sounds that, I, that sounds I, good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a little embarrassed to say that you have to go to a German website to do this, but I I think that the German Space Agency has put together a really outstanding set of tutorials that are free to everybody to download and use that uh I would highly highly recommend. Uh they're all the people who did it are all good colleagues and friends of mine. I really applaud them for putting the effort into it. It's called um Oh shoot. <laughs> I think it's uh, so, let me just google it in a sec. I think it's saredu. dot uh, dot de. Well, well I second. tell you what, I I, I can uh, I can make life a little easier here because what we'll do actually is post on the archive the answers to these questions and and you can just include it there if you'd like and uh, and then the the audience members can can access it from there. Sure. Uh, yeah. Unless you want to pull it up quickly, you're more than welcome to do that. Well, it is. It's saredu.dlr.de. Okay. So that's so, recorded. So it's accessible there, but we'll also have it in the in the archive uh, question answers. Sounds good. Okay, great. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm I'm afraid we're uh, out of time. Uh, we do have a few more questions here, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll we will follow up with those offline. Uh, and, and as I said uh, just a few seconds ago, this will all be archived uh, as well, and this will be archived on the Society website at mtt.org. Uh, also, all registrants will get an email reminder with that uh, address when it's available. For the attendees uh, who would like to receive uh, the PDH credits, uh, on the slide that's shown right now, there's a code, uh, and so you can uh, follow the link uh, to... to access that and use the code provided on this last slide so you can uh, uh, submit for, for receiving those PDH credits. And once again, uh, I'd definitely like to thank Dr. Rosen for this excellent presentation. Our thanks also go out to our sponsor for this webinar, who is National Instruments. Uh, and special thanks to our audience today uh, for joining us. We hope you found today's event valuable and that you'll return for future IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcasts. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you.